Welcome to a mini-series of Neurosalience, featuring interviews with some of this year's annual meeting's keynote speakers. So perhaps I, we can start with the last question on the list, because I guess that is the most interesting for uh, most of us, since we didn't get to see many details on the website. So. Uh, regarding the topic of your talk for this year's OHPM, if you could say a few words and give us uh, some uh, some uh, details on that. It doesn't have to be a lot if you would rather not. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think the topic of the talk will be something along the lines of cortical imaging is deep learning the answer. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I accept that this is a really open question and potentially quite a contentious one. Uh, and it would be it would be great to be able to initiate in a discussion along those lines. So, I mean, my personal opinion is that, you know, it's really important that we continue to, to develop um, classical methods alongside deep learning methods, because until we have deep learning methods that we might be able to trust, if we ever have deep learning methods that we all comprehensively trust, you know, in the absence of that, classical methods are vitally important for improving our understanding of the mechanistic, you know, um, uh, processes um, beneath many aspects of clinical and cognitive neuroscience. But my team both works on the development of pushing forward the improvement of classical methods and developing, I believe, quite exciting new deep learning technology. So the talk will be a careful balance of new results derived from classical uh, cortical surface based processing, including topics such as investigating the development of cortical asymmetries and neonates and the biomechanics of cortical folding, whilst also uh, touching on the development of novel deep learning and particularly geometric deep learning technologies for surface domains that will look at things such as um, generative modeling of neurodevelopment so that we can potentially build biomarkers that would allow us to uh, predict outcomes of preterm babies, physics informed biomechanical models of uh, Alzheimer's, uh, surface vision transformers for precision segmentation. Uh, and cortical phenotype regression uh, topic is along those lines mm -hmm. uh, time allowing you know people can um, <laughs> can express their opinions on the how, what the balance that should be and we'll work it out closer to time it will definitely be an exciting talk I know I will be super excited because I am also you know playing around a little bit with with the uh, interpretable machine learning but just the classical approaches, since uh, I'm more interested in practical applications and not so much in the development aspect, but more into tackling the limitations that we're currently dealing with. And since you mentioned at some point that uh, people don't necessarily yet trust uh, the deep learning approaches or not uniformly, uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think it takes for us to get there to a point of consensus with respect to their utility that we haven't achieved yet? So fundamentally if we're talking about clinical translation in particular, then what we need are learning-based frameworks which are accountable for their decisions. So when a clinician was wanting to rely on a, a, a machine for, for a diagnostic support tool, then they need to know why the, what, what the reasoning is behind that decision of the machine. And so black box machine models on their own are just, just never going to I think, deliver in the terms of clinical practice. So we need explainable AI models that will give us a better understanding of what the decision is. I think um, not just that, we also need, I think if the goal is precision diagnosis, we need to go further than just detection and towards sort of tailored simulations of of macroscopic brain processes such as neurological digital twins but you know in order to be able to to even think about starting to think about any of those things translating into the clinic we need to deal with problems um, around concerns of bias um, in the networks worries over how well they generalize to new data sets 
concerns over issues such as um, uh, adversarial um, attacks, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots still to work on. This seems to be generally valid for pretty much any kind of machine learning approach that we try to translate in the clinic. It doesn't uh, seem to me like it's very particular to uh, deep neural networks. True. Um, I thought that, well, I mean, are we talking about here general methods, including classical machine learning or, or any approach? Uh, well, let's talk about your approach, the one that you are going to, to talk about. Uh, the uh, the generative deep learning approach, for example, the one that you talk about in your 2022 paper. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and how that uh, perhaps overcomes certain limitations that we currently deal with, perhaps from other approaches? Um... Yeah, so I think the differences between deep learning and other classical approaches are different. So if we're talking about ICAM, which is a mm -hmm. paper that we published in 2022, yes. The motivation for that came from many, many years working on classical image registration problems <laughs> and knowing that you know, currently we are not able to perfectly align an entire population of brain imaging data such that all features in the images completely overlap and potentially may never be able to. So image registration is itself what is called an ill-posed problem, which means that there are many possible ways of deforming any in individual image to map onto another image, and that many of those possible solutions could be seen as good ones. And so um, in in the absence of being able to explore all possible variability, we all um, all possible options that like we impose regularization in the form of you know, um, bio uh, biologically informed constraints. And usually that means that we enforce our image registration algorithms to be diffeomorphic. Yes. And that means that if we've got an image registration, which is being which is being defined on some, some grid, we don't let that grid fold and we don't let it tear. Yes. And the problem is, is that there's a huge amount of evidence now in the literature that that, it, that model doesn't really represent the breadth of variability across human brains. So you see examples in the HCP cortical parcellation, for example, of instances where you would need to tear the, the image grid in order to perform a perfect matching. So in the absence of being able to find a solution for image registration, you know, what can you do? And deep learning is an attractive option because deep networks can be trained to be um, deformation or transformation invariant. So you don't need to have your data perfectly aligned. You could just, you, you generally start with rigidly or affirmly aligned data. But the problem as we've already sort of touched on with deep networks is that the early discriminative approaches of classification and regression, these are generally black box networks that give you no indication of what's driving their decision. And the other problem with like classification is that there is nothing forcing a classifier, be it a deep learning one or a classical machine learning method, to learn all features specific to some phenotype that you're trying to classify. So for example, if you were talking about Alzheimer's, um, and you had a population of brains with Alzheimer's disease and those with healthy, a classifier network would probably, all it would need to do is focus on differences in volume of the hippocampus and ventricles. And that would be enough to discriminate the two populations. And essentially it can then ignore all of the cortical atrophy or the variable patterns of the heterogeneous patterns of disease in the individuals. Um, and so these issues with like the, with the heterogeneity of disease have already been picked up by other people such as Andre Marcon and others who are working on normative modeling, uh, where they highlight that there's always going to be a problem with classical approaches um, for comparing populations, which assume that everybody varies in the same way because diseases present heterogeneously and individual brains are highly variable. But I think the problem with, with many of these normative modeling approaches um, as I understand it, them, is they're based on regression, usually Gaussian process regression, uh, which is um, fitting some model of how some feature varies relative to some phenotype or variable such as age or cognitive tests. So then you're back to the problem of having to solve image registration so that you can extract those features across individuals. So the idea of ICAM is to address all these problems and uh, generate something that's akin to a deep normative model. 
So it's deep learning, so it's invariant image registration, and it's generative, so it's being it's being forced to learn all features of disease for individual brains. And it does that by explicitly disentangling those sources of disease specific variation from uh, the natural, the sort of vast space of natural variation of cortical appearance that would otherwise drown it out. And so essentially how it works is that it's learning all features of disease specific to an individual because it's being trained to learn how to translate an image that if it's given an image with some disease class, for example, Alzheimer's, it needs to learn how to translate that image uh, into one that would appear healthy sufficiently well to fool a classifier. And in order to do that, it essentially has to remove all features of disease in that image, every single one, in order to be able to fool that classifier um, over the process of generate of, of training that network. But in but it's not allowed to change that image so far that it it completely changes the appearance of that individual. So you can't put in an image of an Alzheimer's brain and get out a completely different brain. It has to be the same individual where you've changed its appearance to remove all features of disease. And then the difference between the simulated healthy and the ground truth disease then gives you a map of all features of disease that you can use then to track um, disease progression in individuals. So that's really the advantage of these deep networks. Of, you know, of course, you know, we have concerns over their generalization and bias, and rightly so, but they have this potential to, to, to build precision models that are specific to individual brains. That sounds indeed like you are very uh, much getting closer to uh, achieving the desideratum of, of modern psychiatry in that um, to achieve uh, personalized predictions. Um, however, isn't also the appeal of, of um, interpretable machine learning approaches uh, precisely that it kind of uh, operates on a hierarchy of more important or more relevant features to less relevant features, and in that respect, it allows us to perform uh, dimensionality reduction. So, for example, that might favor uh, our our ability to implement these approaches with also smaller data sets, which still is kind of an issue for some areas of neuroscience where uh, we would not necessarily be able to achieve the best performance with a classifier uh, if we have a very large number of features but a very limited sample size. So I can definitely see the appeal of, of uh, going all the way throughout the pipeline with the maximum number of features to improve personalized prediction. But on the other hand, this seems to preclude what uh, some approaches uh, seem to, to propose as appealing and useful in that it, it reduces the number of features instead of enforcing all the features being considered throughout. Not sure I entirely follow. So for example, with you... uh, random forest, right? You can use random forest for dimensionality reduction. So uh, when you run such a, an algorithm uh, on a particular data set, you can look at variable importance, for example, at the end and observe a hierarchy of importance values attached to uh, those features and say your, your sample is, is large enough, is in the hundreds, and you have also a, a feature set uh, in the dozens, which is an okay balance. It doesn't prevent the algorithm from, from achieving its maximum performance, but then you would like to verify this out of sample performance, right, in an individual, in, in an independent sample, but say you don't have access to a sample that's large enough to carry on the uh, classification using the original feature set, which would be too large uh, to, to uh, use uh, altogether in a smaller data set. And therefore you would go through a process of dimensionality reduction based on your initially observed importance values, right, to reduce the number of features. Um, however, it seems that what you suggest is that it's actually better to preserve as many features as possible to individuate a particular case. I think more the problem is that you can't always guarantee that you can extract those features accurately mm -hmm. in a hand engineered way from individual brains. Mm -hmm. So you might say that you want to uh, make a simplified model where your brain region across individuals and, and so often what people do is they go and they they tend to use cortical folding atlases like the desk and kiliani or something like that but then these 
atlases are based on individual brains or small populations of brains. They don't capture all the individual variability. There's a dissociation between function and folding. So actually, you know, if you're averaging properties within large folding regions, you may not be capturing um, individual small functional areas. And then you're averaging across lots of different imaging properties across a, you know, a range of regions. And then you, you lose your discriminative ability. If you're trying to extract regions, then if you don't, you're not actually accurately extracting small regions of the cortex, for example, that are functionally specific. I think the idea generally is that, you know, that with image registration, you're no longer constrained to try and hand engineer features that you don't know that you are guaranteed to be able to extract across individuals, because at the end of the day, most of these features are extracted through image registration, which is flawed. And so... It's not a golden bullet because with deep learning, you, of course, need much larger data sets. So I, this is why I say that I would always do both. Well, currently, I will always work on both, both classical methods and deep learning methods. But there's always that question of like, how far can you push image registration? How much can you really extract, you know, individual cortical regions out across many individuals and therefore how sensitive your features are. If you're talking about subtle neuro, subtle features of many neuropsychiatric disorders, you know, they're, they're tiny differences in small areas of the cortex and they're very difficult to, to spot. And so the main issue is classical image processing. Essentially you're averaging, you're, you're looking for, you need to be hugely highly statistically powered to see signals in these populations because there's so much image processing noise. I see. Well, that sounds like you had to overcome a lot of challenges throughout the, the development of, of, of throughout the process of developing these, these approaches. Can you talk a little bit about what those challenges, well, at least the most memorable might have been um, and, and how you overcame them? Uh, I'm asking this in the hope that it may inspire other young researchers out there who are probably also trying to tackle the big questions in the field and are feeling a little bit despondent and perhaps not being able to see any light at the end of the tunnel? Oh, this is a difficult question. I mean, I think that whenever you're trying to develop a deep learning network on to model complicated problems, you always need to be able to develop some sort of simulation or toy example so that you can train the network so that you know that at least you need to be able to disentangle knowing whether your model is performing how your how your you think you've coded it up to do relative to whether actually the thing that you're looking for isn't in the data and on also at the same time you've always got this undercurrent of knowing whether you've got enough data whether the data is harmonized enough whether you've processed it, processed it the same way in order to be able to find what you're looking for so we like we, we're endlessly going back and rerunning image processing trying to harmonize through histogram based matching redo, redoing the brain extraction to remove all of try and re further and further remove bits of the skull so it's not getting distracted or things like this i think even with learning based approaches many people tend to approach it in a data agnostic way right they put the data in and out they want to get something out they're not actually always verifying and checking whether there's anything wrong with all the data that's going in and whether the results that are coming out make sense and that's why having some some level of explainable model which is telling telling you what it's doing is useful because otherwise you're kind of working in the dark it makes absolute sense and and speaking of of having to go through this iterative process of of checking whether what what comes out of your pipeline makes sense or not and not just trusting an obscure model um how how um did you reach this level of knowledge uh where did you have a particular mentors that you, that were especially influential or maybe inspiring throughout your career yeah i think you know my research ethos was firmly grounded through a um sort of interdisciplinary start to my research career so i started by uh, doing my PhD in medical image computing at Imperial College with Professor Daniel Rooker. But then I went to work on the Human Connectome Project, working for Mark Jenkinson and Stephen Smith at uh, the Fimmer Centre Oxford. On the, uh, um, and during all that time, also had the great fortune to be working closely alongside really knowledgeable 
clinicians. So uh, particularly thinking of um, professors David Edwards and Mary Rutherford at King's College London, who are expert neonatologists, and um, Matt Glasser and David Van Essen in the Human Connecting Project, whom everyone knows are experts in brain anatomy. And that taught me so much. And it left me with the philosophy that, you know, I'm I'm not afraid to try and develop, you know, you know, push the boundaries of what can be done with methodology methodology, but there's really no point in doing any of that if what you're developing isn't going to be practically useful for clinicians and neuroscientists. And so I think that ethos has underpinned everything that I've done so far. Thank you. To the point uh, that you mentioned uh, of your working with the um Human Connection Project. Um, I also inserted a tiny question there because this has gathered a lot of attention, at least in in my um, bubble. Um, this larger project now that's been funded by the EU uh, with digital twins and and uh, personalized psychiatric predictions, for example, for Alzheimer's. How do you see the potential for that to move things forward? And do you plan on getting involved with that at some point, or or uh, jumping on the the newer uh, approach how how do you feel about it yeah I mean I was not aware of that specific project um until you sent it which looks really <laughs> interesting and you know if they wanted me to be involved you know I'd be very happy to um but, but uh you know in general I feel I, I agree the future is towards neurological digital twins uh but that's no easy task so what a neurological digital twin essentially is, is a simulation of some macroscopic mm -hmm. brain process. And so I know in another, you, you were interested in the extent to which it can be done for neuropsychiatric disorders. And the, you know, the question of whether that's possible is, you know, can you, you have to start with some causal, you know, mechanistic model of what you think is driving those disorders in order to be able to know how to build some neurological digital twin of how to do that. So I just think there's so much opportunity, um, but it's very difficult because we, you know, there's so you, there's so much variability. You need to account for not just the phenotypic variability related to some disease, but you've also got to account for all of the sources of natural variability, and all of that has to build into one model. And then you've got you're all you're, all, you're always going to have limited data to model that relative to the amount of data that's available in natural image, um, you know, for natural image. Yep tasks one way to address that is to add physics informed constraints to your model but yeah so absolutely very very interested in doing this we've got some early work where a phd student of mine mariana de silva built a physics informed um neural network model of the biomechanics of brain atrophy and healthy aging versus alzheimer's and so excited to do more in that area but it's i, I I think there's a lot of problems to be solved before you'd be getting into the area of that, like moving in towards clinical translation. For sure. It seems that perhaps they were uh, well informed where they, when they chose Alzheimer's as their model uh, for to, to get this started, since you also get more anatomical parameters that you can potentially tap into that give you some sort of ground truth that is easier, perhaps, or, or more reliable to get to as opposed to other disorders. Uh, where you wouldn't really know where to start and what parameters to even start with. And that that that's where my question regarding feature importance and, and feature selection came from. Um, because with other disorders that are, are uh, less anatomically identifiable, we are left with a lot of questions and very few physics-informed models that would help us get to the ground truth to even start building our causal I models. Think, yeah, I mean, this is the thing. This is why classical methods remain important. You need classical approaches for analyzing populations of data to continue to inform your mechanistic understanding of these diseases building a digital twin of a disease but can you build a digital twin of healthy condition and use that as a normative model yeah. of you know like from which to look at look for deviations with patients with complex neuropsychiatric disorders I mean it's a fascinating but like intimidating question yes I agree <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, I will not hold you any, any longer. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, and I'm looking forward to your talk at OHPAN.